we're going to be talking about the consequences of the Great War, the First World War. It is something that does, as I mentioned last time, have a shattering impact on Western civilization and culture, something that shapes the views not merely of a, a generation that followed and was affected by the war, but really of everything that has happened since. We are still living in the shadow of the First World War. So let's talk about some of what this was like. Part of the reason it had such a huge impact is just what it was like to fight in this war. Millions of people died in the war, but the millions who survived came back fundamentally changed by what they had seen. The way in which this war was conducted was perhaps more savage and more terrible than any preceding war. People who had a conception of war based on the past, where armies would line up across a field, wearing uniforms, firing at one another, and so on, it was not like that at all. Trench warfare was a new kind of thing. And many, many people died from disease in the trenches, died from all sorts of other things. As we'll see later this week, the Spanish flu, which spread, spread very rapidly in 1918, partly because of the conditions of the war, um, led to millions more deaths than even had died in the fight. Well, we talked about battle deaths last time. <laughs> the Battle of the Somme. 306,000 people died. Soldiers referred to it as the great, well, yes, um, the great F-up. The largest, it was the largest engagement fought since the beginnings of civilization. It involved not only the greatest number of deaths in history, but the greatest number of combatants in history. For one thing, a four month long battle was an extraordinary thing. The size of the armies involved, the scale of the fighting, all of that was extraordinary. And in addition to that, the fact that, in a sense, people just stayed there. Here we're not talking about civilian cities overrun, slaughters taking place or anything of that sort. Those things had happened historically, but the 306,000 people would die in a single battle was really almost inconceivable. And as we pointed out, there were five other battles that claimed more than 100,000 lives each. Okay, we're done. 305,000, almost as many. So the scale of death in this war was absolutely astounding. And there is a huge collection of graveyards in especially northern France, but also in Belgium and other parts of northern Europe, reflecting the death tolls we were talking about last time. Millions of Germans, Russians, Frenchmen, Britons, Australia, Austrians, uh, Turks, and so on, dead as a result of the war. In general, more than 16 million died. An astounding percentage. We talked at the end of last time about why. The fact that this was a new kind of warfare. There was a new sense of military strategy. An unbelievable, stupid sense of military strategy that the solution to any problem was to just throw more and more soldiers at it. Uh, there was a terrible lack of communication and of information on the part of those who were leaders. And, to some degree, historians largely agree, there was an incredible density, i.e. stupidity, on the part of the leaders. Now, that's not to say that everyone involved was a poor military leader. There were some remarkably good generals involved in this war, but they were mostly fighting for the Germans on the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front generals were actually excellent. They did a very good job of defeating Russia and driving it out of the war. And in fact, at the end of the war, why did the Germans lose? To some extent, they lost because those generals and the troops that had been stationed on the Eastern Front and were very effective at destroying the Russian army were shifted to the Western Front. That should have gained a tremendous advantage to the Germans, and in a way, it did. The Germans immediately came over from the Eastern Front and said, what, you're just sending waves of soldiers into enemy machine gun fire, trying to cross no man's land and barbed wire and so on to displace them from the trenches? That's insane. That's not the way you do this. How would you fight an army that was heavily entrenched apart from you? I'm really asking you now, what would you do? They've got machine guns. They've got placements. There's barbed wire separating you from them. How would you try to break their lines? Flush them out. Flush them out, you say? Yes. Uh, well, uh, OK. Yes. <laughs> With sufficient technology, you might be able to I mean, it's already swampy. Maybe you could flood them out somehow. Um, maybe you could do some other things. But what other strategies could you use with First World War technology? Yeah. Either go over them or go under them with uh, artillery or uh, mines, basically. OK, you could try artillery and mines. And indeed, people did that. 
Artillery shells turned out to be devastating uh, for the British and French army. The Germans were very, very effective at pounding the British and French lines with artillery. Uh, Allied artillery was not nearly so effective. Uh, in breaking the German lines. In fact, the Battle of the Somme, people thought were, it was going to be won easily. They amassed a very large contingent of soldiers. They bombarded the German lines for days, and they were convinced there would be almost no one left alive in those trenches. And so when they came out, they were astounded to fire by the Germans there, completely intact, shooting. Now, why was that true? The trenches the British and French had were very primitive. They were just dug out on the ground. There was not much to them. They didn't fill up with water. They were basically cesspits of disease. Um, the German trenches were in most places where they had been any length of time, not like that at all. In fact, they were two-level trenches, and they were heavily fortified. So they went down very deep, and halfway down, they had heavy steel plates, which meant when things got bad above ground, you simply went under the steel plates. So where were the Germans for those three days of artillery pounding before the Battle of the Somme? Underground. They went down into the lower trenches. And they were really quite well outfitted, so they survived the shelling very well. Then, when the shelling stopped, they popped up their machine gun <laughs> placements and were able to mow the British and French down. Had 60,000 wounded and killed on the very first day of the Somme. So that's something that was only partially effective. It was, in some cases, very, very effective, but the German trenches were actually well fortified against it. Yes? Cut off their uh, supplies. You could try to cut off supplies. Um, now, how would you get to the supplies? After all, they're coming in from the rear. You'd have to somehow get to the rear of the trenches. How would you do that? How would you go through the airplane? Uh, well, you could try bombing, you could try air aerial attacks. There were bombers and so on. They weren't immensely effective because they didn't have very good navigation systems. Um, nevertheless, there was some attempt to do that. What else? Uh, bait them into attacking and then just bleed them out on the defense? You could try to bait them into attacking, and there was a huge amount of that that took place. But on the other hand, after several years of that, it was costing both sides huge numbers of men without really making much of an advance. Yeah. Move troops to the behind and surround them up. Um, Ally and uh, the two forces actually tried to do that in a race to see if that was there, and they never pushed forward. Okay, good. You can try to outflank them, and there was such a thing right at the beginning of the war a race to the sea to try to get around the enemy, uh, enemy line. Um, as it turned out, they, neither side succeeded in doing that, but that would be a good strategy under normal situations. Yeah? Did they end up using uh, they did use chemical weapons, um, poison gas. Uh, it turned out that, although that horrified people, um, it led to many fewer battle deaths than you might imagine, for a couple of reasons. It was first used on the Eastern Front against the Russians, um, and nothing happened. It turns out that the poison gases only worked within a certain temperature range, and on the Eastern Front it was generally too cold, so it didn't work. Um, they used it some on the Western Front, but it was just as likely to attack your own soldiers because it depended which way the wind was blowing. And people didn't have good enough meteor meteorolo meteorological information to actually predict wind flow. So on, in some cases, they released the poison gas only to find the wind blew it right back at them. Um, the soldiers also improvised. Eventually, they had gas masks that they could put on the masks that would protect them. But people, after the first use, actually had figured out a method for counteracting the gas. It's disgusting, but it worked. What's your name? You pee on a sock and breathe through the urine in the sock. It smells bad, but it worked. Okay? So if you're ever subject to a mustard or chlorine gas attack, <laughs> you know what to do. You can say, well, I learned something from that philosopher. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, here was what the Germans on the Eastern Front had done. They relied on mobility. They had small groups usually on horseback, and what they did was actually just parade through. They found small weaknesses in the Russian lines and had used rapid mobility in small groups. Rather than having masses of tens of thousands of soldiers come over the line, they would send units out under cover of darkness. Almost always on the Western Front, the attacks took place at dawn. And if the attack didn't come right at dawn, you knew you were safe for the rest of the day. Uh, so they sent people out at night when they were not easily observed. They sent small groups out. They, in short, engaged in something like guerrilla warfare. 
and it turned out to be just as successful in the West as it was in the East. They were able to break through the British and French trenches. In fact, without the British and French even knowing, these small platoons were able to come under cover of darkness and actually cross over the trenches largely unobserved. They came through no man's land. They had to pick their way around the, the uh, barbed wire very carefully. But then they could go and act, they acted as if they were just retrieving bodies. They ended up actually making it through and breaking the British and French lines. Now it turned out to be a disaster. And here's one of the ironies of the war. Paul Fussell, who's written a wonderful book about this, The Great War in Modern Memory, points out that, and that wasn't the right page. Oh, here it is. <laughs> they, uh, a successful attack ruins troops. In a way, it's just like defeat. What happened when the British forces and the French forces actually gave way and the Germans were able to sweep through to behind the lines? Now imagine that you're a German soldier. You've been in these trenches. And unlike the British and French, you can't easily escape to your hometown for a long weekend or something. You've been in these trenches for years, miserable fighting conditions. Finally, you break through to the rear, and you get to a French village like Albert. And there, you find wine. You find cheese. You find clothing. You find the things you would find in a shopping district in a small town. What do you do? You raid it. And so here is a German officer who is trying to figure out why he can't communicate with his troops. They've broken through the lines. They're back there. They're supposed to be disrupting the supply lines to the British and French. They're supposed to be surrounding them so that now the Germans can wipe out the British and French armies and force a surrender. And he's wondering why he hasn't heard from his troops. Today, the advance of our infants. If I could, I would do a German accent, but I'm going to sound like Rainier Hardcastle and the Simpsons trying to imitate Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I won't do it. <laughs> Today, the advance of our infantry suddenly stopped near Albert. Nobody can understand why. Our airmen had reported no enemy between Albert and Amiel. I jumped into a car with orders to find out what was causing the stoppage. As soon as I got near Albert, I began to see curious sights. Strange figures, which looked very little like soldiers, and certainly showed no sign of advancing, were making their way back out of the town. There were men driving cows before them. Others who carried a hen under one arm and a box of notepaper under the other. Men carrying a bottle of wine under the arm and another one open in their hand. Men who had torn a silk drawing room curtain off from its rods and were dragging it to the rear. More men with writing paper and colored notebooks. Men dressed up in comic disguise. Men with top hats on their heads. Men staggering. Men who could hardly walk. At one point, in fact, the German commanding officer gets there and sees his troops just wandering around the town drunk. And he goes and says, where, where is the wait? That's only half the platoon. Where are the rest of them? And the lieutenant said, they're down there, sir, in the basement of this shop. So, said, well, what's down there? That's the wine cellar. <laughs> he says, well, you get down there and order them to come out. And he said, um, sir, I will have to kill them. <laughs> get them out of there. Uh, if you want to get them out, you better go down there yourself. And so the officer basically just gave up. And that, in short, is what the Germans did once they broke through the lines. They partied. <laughs> uh, now, that sounds absurd, but they couldn't easily communicate with the, the front lines. They didn't receive orders. They didn't effectively do things. In fact, now they were easily surrounded and captured by the British and the French. So what initially looked like a tremendous military success on the part of the Germans ended up leading to the German defeat. Well, actually, the problems with morale, what this suggests, had started way earlier. Already by December 1914, just five months into the war, the troops in the trenches in the Western Front declared a Christmas truce. They came out to no man's land and simply celebrated Christmas Day together. The commanding officers on both sides were appalled, and they saw to it that this never happened again. But the troops realized that there was something absurd about standing here in these trenches and attacking those forces over there. This war, keep in mind, wasn't really about anything. Why were they fighting? Because some Serbian, who was a member of the Black Hand, shot some archduke, who actually, even his own father, didn't like very much. And now we're supposed to be killing each other? And there was this strong sense that, look, the people on the German side were human beings, too, that you really had no grievance against them. In fact, often what happened, in addition to this overt cooperation, was more covert kinds of cooperation, where there would be some subtle signal that we're about to start shelling you guys, and so people would hide, some they'd lob a few shells, often intentionally misfired, 
and then they'd wait. Then the next day, the Germans would shoot some shells back. <laughs> and in short, people recognized, look, we don't want to kill you guys. We don't want to be killed. Why don't we just like pretend to fight <laughs> instead of really fighting? And so now a lot of them were nevertheless dying in the attacks that were forced. But people didn't really want to attack the people on the other side. By the beginning of 1916, the initial excitement about the war had died away. Britain found they couldn't get enough volunteers, and they instituted a draft. Fusel refers to that as the beginning of the modern world, um, the beginning of a conscript army that was going to be forced to go to the front. And by late 1916, after the Somme and the other battles, morale was so low that there were mutinies. Troops were refusing to follow orders. Um, troops would be ordered, all right, over the front. They would refuse, or in many cases, the French troops would obey the orders, fearing that they would be shot if they didn't, but nevertheless would protest by going, bah, bah, as they came up out of the trenches. Okay, why did they do that? They were sheep being led to the slaughter. Okay, and they basically had, one, one writer about the war who served said, at a certain point, the entire line was forced to stand, and the commanding officer that said, now count in threes. So they did one, two, three, one, two, three, et cetera. And they said, everybody who was a number three, over, oh, you're attacking today. And suddenly, they realized, like, oh my gosh. And he reported about his best friend who was standing beside him. He was number two, the best friend was number three. <laughs> the best friend went out there and 10 minutes later was dead, shot down by machine gun fire. And so there was an overwhelming sense that, yeah, if you were ordered out of those trenches, you were dead. Uh, and the, the troops began to protest against it and refused to do it. Well, this made the governments involved increase their propaganda efforts. And that made compromise more difficult. How do you say that the Germans are barbarian monsters and then turn around and say, oh, but we're going to negotiate a peace with them? And the same thing, of course, on the other side. How do you say that the French are subhuman and then turn around and negotiate with them? So you see outrageous propaganda, things like this. The world cannot live half slave, half free. Look, the, the central powers there marked out in red, the Prussian plot. <laughs> President Wilson says of the Germans, their plan was to throw a broad belt of German military power and political control across the very center of Europe and beyond the Mediterranean Sea into the heart of Asia, then actually carried the greater part of that amazing plan into execution. Well, there was no such plan. This was ridiculous. It actually sort of fits World War II. It didn't fit World War I. The Kaiser proclaims, and now this is entirely made up. Woe and death unto those who oppose my will. Death to the infidel who divides my mission. Let all the enemies of the German nation perish. God demands their destruction. <laughs> well, of course, the Kaiser said no such thing. But that's something that was being put out by governments on all sides. OK, while well, Germany dreams of dominating the world by force, there can be no peace. Here's another one. Only the Navy can stop this. And you see a German soldier with blood dripping over his sword and babies at his feet. Aww. Now, there were things on the other side, too, by the way. Uh, the Germans had similar kinds of propaganda. It got very nasty on both sides. Now, here's a map of Europe by 1918, the end of the war. You see lots of nations that didn't exist before the war. Czechoslovakia, for example, carved out of what had been the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria, now very small. Hungary, much smaller. The country of Yugoslavia, put together basically as a reward to Serbia for being on the winning side. The Serbs now got control of a much larger region, including the Croatians, the Montenegrins, um, the Slovenians, and so on. Romania, much larger, taking up part of what had been Austria-Hungary. Poland created out of Germany and Russia, and so on. Now, what effect did all of this have on people? The horror of the fighting itself, the seeming arbitrariness of the war, the fact that it made very little sense, it, re it resulted in a huge loss of faith. A loss of faith in political leaders, in military leaders, who had led people into this debacle, but also in democracy, a loss of faith in civilization itself. There was a sense that, look, we thought we knew the truth. We thought we were in an age of progress. We thought we had gotten beyond the barbaric aspects of human nature, and we're enlightened. And now, in fact, we call that period, the end of the 18th century, the Enlightenment. And now we thought, and the 19th century was indeed, overall, after Napoleon anyway, a pretty peaceful century. And suddenly, 
boom, at least in Europe, I mean, not in the United States. <laughs> but in Europe, it had been a relatively peaceful century. And all of a sudden, we're led into this kind of senseless fighting that leads to death on a scale heretofore unimagined. So Philip Larkin, writing much later, later, sorry, writing much later, writes a poem, 1914. And here's one stanza from the poem. Never such innocence, never before since, has changed itself to pass without a word. The men leaving the gardens tidy, the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer. Never such innocence again. People went off to this war thinking they had a stable life, stable set of values, that they understood what was true. And by the end of the war, they were convinced that none of that was right, that all of it is a lie. That stability had been a false front. The knowledge they thought they had, the enlightenment they thought they had, now all of it looked bogus. And so Fusel writes that the innocent army fully attained the knowledge of good and evil at the Somme on July 1st. What they really came to grips with was the fact that that whole world, the world that made sense to them, suddenly looked incoherent, barbaric. It was as if they had peeled the peel off the banana and saw something horrifying inside. Um, they had somehow seen the underbelly of what really was under going on, and they came to think of civilization as this false front over a horrible reality. So look at Hemingway's reaction in A Farewell to Arts. Abstract words such as glory, honor, courage, or hallow were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the number of roads, the names of rivers, the numbers of regiments and their dates. Okay, next to Verdun, 1916, or the Somme, or next to Emile, or Argonne, or whatever. All of that seemed absurd. All of that seemed utterly obscene. Once you've lived through this, you've been on a battlefield filled with the smell of the bloated and rotting bodies. You've seen friends blown up, other friends die of disease. By the way, at the Somme, there were something like 20,000 soldiers wounded who were not killed out there in no man's land, it in many cases took them days to die, days during which no one could help them. The cries of the wounded were heard for days after that initial assault. Once people had witnessed that, they were never the same again. All Quiet on the Western Front is a book written about the German experience. This is a German soldier writing about the war. There was a famous movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, made by this. And the German account is very, very similar to the British and French accounts. A similar kind of disillusion results. This book, it says right at the outset, is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, least of all an adventure. For death is not an adventure of those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. So the point is, yes, something like 9 to 10 million soldiers dead, 16 to 17 million all told dead, but what about those who survived? They, too, were destroyed, but in a different way. Some, of course, physically wounded and suffered from those wounds, but many destroyed psychologically. We're at rest, he begins, five miles behind the front. Yesterday, we were relieved, and now our bellies are full of beef and haricot beans. We're satisfied at peace. Each man has another mess tin full for the evening. What's more, there's a double ration of sausage and bread. That puts a man in fine trim. We haven't had such luck as this for a long time. So, okay, great. They get double rations. They have lots of food and are actually eating until they're full for the first time in a long time. Now, why? What happened? Yeah. That's right. So many people had been killed in their unit that there weren't many survivors left. So there was lots more food than they needed. <laughs> okay, so in a way, good luck that so many of their colleagues had died. And so it was an awfully dark beginning. Uh, yes, we were, we were lucky ones because we survived and lots and lots of the soldiers in this unit died. Now, there are various aspects of life in the trenches that emerge in this book that you might not have thought about otherwise. One is the utter lack of sleep. Last night we moved back and settled down to get a good sleep for once. Kaczynski was right when he says it wouldn't be such a bad war if only you could get a little more sleep. In the line we've had next to none, and 14 days is a long time at one stretch. People began rotating people through the trenches more and more rapidly, partly for health reasons, partly psychologically people couldn't bear it, partly because you could not sleep. At this point, the Germans were sending people up to the front for a two-week stretch at a time. During that time, there would be shelling. You would get a lot of the work done at night uh, because it was only under cover of darkness that you could, for example, retrieve bodies from no man's land or do anything like that. Uh, and so there was basically no sleep. 
There was constant noise. There was, of course, the problem of water in the trenches, which was worse on the British and French side. But nevertheless, it was almost impossible to get any sleep. There was huge suffering. And even for those who were not wounded, suffering was all around. Big was one of the first to fall. He got hit in the eye during an attack. We left him lying for dead. We couldn't bring him with us because we had to come back helter skelter. In the afternoon, suddenly we heard him call and saw him crawling about in no man's land. He had only been knocked unconscious. Because he couldn't see and was mad with pain, he failed to keep under cover. He was shot down before anyone could go and fetch him. Now, what about the officers? You've got people giving orders under these conditions. You can imagine what the enlisted men thought of the officers who were giving them orders. In some cases, orders to go up and out of the trenches to nearly certain death. We couldn't blame Cantoric for this. Where would the world be if one brought every man to book? There were thousands of Cantorics, this is an officer, all of whom were convinced that they were acting for the best, in a way that cost them nothing. And that's why they let us down so badly. So, he basically says, yes, the officers, we were just lads of 18. What did we know? We were new in confronting this situation. The officers were supposed to explain to us what to do. They were supposed to have to survive. But instead of doing that, well, gosh, we trusted them. But we had to recognize with the first death that they weren't to be trusted. The first death shattered this belief. We had to recognize that our generation was more to be trusted than theirs. Now, why? What gave them the special wisdom? Just that confrontation with death. The officers had been trained in a school. They had never seen warfare. To them, it was all theoretical. But these people who were actually doing the fighting, they were the ones who had to cross. They were the ones who faced the enemy machine guns. They were the ones who saw their colleagues fall. The first bombardment, the bar bombardment showed us our mistake. Under it, the worlds they had taught us broke into pieces. While they continued to write and talk, we saw the wounded and dying. While they taught the duty to one's country is the greatest thing, we already knew that death throes are stronger. Now, one thing that emerges from this is that the old world, as people know, was simply gone. It just wasn't there anymore. And even when people went back after the war to civilian life, they couldn't fit in. They couldn't adapt. We loved our country as much as they. We went courageously in that reaction. But we also distinguished the false from the true. We had suddenly learned to see. And we saw that there was nothing of their world left. Everything that they had known began to look fake. So, youth. We started out this war young. <laughs> That's the way we, those officers think. Iron youth, youth, we're none of us more than 20 years old, but young, ah, that's long ago. We are old folk. Once they had been in these battle situations, they felt as if there was just a radical discontinuity in their lives. They could no longer believe what they had believed, no longer trust the people they had trusted, no longer actually feel that they had a future in the way that they had felt before. Now, part of what made this so difficult was the role of just chance. The fact that who lived and who died had so little to do with merit or skill or anything else seemed mostly a matter of chance. The front is a cage in which we must wait fearfully, whatever may happen. We lie under the network of arching shells and live in a suspense of uncertainty. Over us, chance hovers. If a shot comes, we can duck, that's all. We neither know nor can determine where it will fall. It's chance that makes us indifferent. Because after all, if it's nothing you can do, if it's just a matter of luck, whether you survive or not, what's the point of doing anything? And so, after a while, people just become indirect. He stands up, he goes to visit some friends in another dugout, comes back, nothing more was to be seen of that first game. It had been thrown to pieces by a direct hit. So, he says, it's just as, ma as much a matter of chance that I'm still alive as that I might have been hit. Chance? Every soldier believes in chance and trusts his luck. So the result is this deep sense of alienation. Alienation from, yes, the older people, from the officers, but also from the values of the civilization that had led to this. We could never again regain the old intimacy with those scenes. It wasn't any recognition of their beauty or the significance that attracted us, but the communion, the feeling of congress, the things and the events of our existence, which cut us off and made the world of our parents seem incomprehensible to us. A lot of participants in the war found it completely incommunicable. They came back and people would say, so what was it like? What was it like at the front? And they didn't know how to say it. They couldn't explain. Paul Nash described it as utterly indescribable. 
H. H. Cooper said the smell arising from the bloated bodies was beyond description. Robert Graves wrote, you couldn't, you can't communicate. Noise, noise never stopped for one moment, ever. And several people said, look, as soon as I would try to describe a scene, it sounds clinical. It sounds like a part of a medical team that is simply surveying a disaster. Uh, you cannot convey what it was actually like to be part of those circumstances. So, the conclusion, we're forlorn like children, and experience like old men. We're crude and sorrowful and superficial. I believe we're lost. And of course, he's talking about the survivors. Let's look at the poem that is maybe the most famous account of the British side of the war, a reaction by someone who fought in it and died in the war, Wilfred Owen. This is, <laughs> you might say, a critique of something that he would have studied as a school. Anybody who had gone to a public school in Britain, and their public school means what we mean by private school, would have been exposed to Horace. Latin was at the time a required subject, and the standard Latin curriculum included Horace uh, as part of what any schoolboy would have learned. Well, Horace wrote the Odes and Epilogues. Um, I didn't study Horace until college, and even then I've got to say my Horace seminar was one student who was officially taking it, me as an auditor, and the professor. That was it. So Horace has come under, well, the popularity of Horace has declined. <laughs> And maybe this poem is partly why. Anyway, this is from Horace's Odes. Dulce et tutorumes pro patria mori, morset tu patrum, sequitur virum, nec partit in belli subvente, oblitibus timidome terno. Which means, how sweet and fitting it is to die for one's country. Death pursues the man who flees, spares not the hamstrings or cowardly backs of battle shot to humans. Horace is saying, look, well, it is sweet and fitting to face death for your country. Those who retreat, those who run away, they're just as likely to die anyway. Now, here is Owen's poem, entitled Dulce et Decorum Est. It is sweet and fitting. <laughs> Bent double like old beggars under sacks, not me, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till all the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots, but lived on bloodshot. All went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, death even to the roots of disappointed shells that dropped behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone was still yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim, through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drown. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. <clears throat> if in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon that we flung at him, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt of blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of bile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest that children are ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum as pro patria. Now, what's the attitude behind that poem? It's bitter. Maybe? It's pretty bitter. It's bitter. You bet it's bitter. <laughs> now, partly I've read it that way, but partly, yes, you just sense a deep bitterness. My friend, you wouldn't tell with such high zest that children aren't for some desperate glory, the old law. Okay, those are bitter words. Somebody who looks back to the people, the people in the government, the people in the schools who were teaching people patriotism of this form, and saying, you bastards, <laughs> you lied to us, you told us this would be great and honorable and beautiful somehow, and instead it was horrible. And the description of the person dying in the gas attack is meant to convey, in some way, the horror of what it was like on the battlefields. Now, this is something that has a lot of sweeping effects. That bitterness, that sense of betrayal, the sense that you can no longer trust, not only those individual people, but in some sense, your entire cultural institutions. What results from that? Well, you might put it this way. The 19th century was the climax of the philosophy of personal responsibility, the notion that each of us individually is accountable for our actions. 
That was the joint heritage, heritage of the Judeo-Christian world, of the classical world, and it all came to seem absurd. Now, why? Well, partly because of the chance element, partly because it wasn't like a very difficult, bloody battleground where only the best survive. It seemed like a horrible, bloody battleground where it was completely random who managed to survive and who did not. And so it looked as if personal responsibility was out the window. Any sense of merit seemed irrelevant. It wasn't a question of skill. It seemed to be blind luck. And it seemed to be an unbelievable stupidity and absurdity that led to this kind of suffering. So the idea in literature and in popular culture of the hero, who is a sort of moral and spiritual success, gets replaced in the 20th century by the anti-hero. Somebody who doesn't seem to have much moral compass, has no real concept of success, no verdict sort of drawn about what is good and evil, what's right and wrong. Instead, you get a kind of sense of moral anarchy. And that's the way it felt on the battlefields of the First World War to these people who were participating, like a moral anarchy. What was good, what was bad, what was right, what was wrong? What was justice? What was injustice? It was unclear. It wasn't even clear what the various sides were fighting for. So we get a sense of progress being thrown out the window. At the opening of the war, H.G. Wells wrote something championing the cause of the war, entitled the book, The War That Will End War. Well, gosh. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Okay, by 1920, J.B. Burry was writing in a book called The Idea of Progress. Notice now, not progress, but the idea of progress doesn't progress itself suggest its value is only relative. And indeed, Paul Fussell writes the Great War reversed. The idea of progress made people think it had all been a lie. Winston Churchill wrote that all the horrors of the ages were brought together. Not only armies, but whole populations were thrust into the midst of them. The mighty educated states involved concede, not without reason, that their very existence was at stake. Neither people nor ruler, rulers drew the line. Any deed they thought they could help, that could help them win. And so here he talks about the horrors, the wounded dying between the lines, the dead bouldering into the soil, merchant ships, neutral ships attack. Every effort made to starve whole nations, cities and monuments smashed by artillery, bombs from the air, poison, gas, liquid fire, Men fell from the air in flames or were smothered off and slowly in the dark recesses of the sea. Well, this was only the beginning of the challenges to civilization. So I want to turn now to some other aspects, some more pleasant aspects. After all, we've been dwelling on the, the sort of horror of the battlefield. But let's back up a minute and think about other things, almost all of which had started before the war, but became magnified tremendously as a result of the war. First, the growth of government. We'll talk about this a bit more, but this greatly increased the size of government on all sides. It was already large in Germany and Austria-Hungary. It became even larger, and it became vast in Western Europe and in the United States as well. Before 1914, almost all governments occupied somewhere between 5 and 10% of gross national product. Um, in the US, well, that's actually not right. Before, well, well before this, it had been less. As things had ramped up toward the war, they had increased. But still, in 1913, if you added the federal government, state governments, local governments together, they amounted to about 9% about of the US economy. But does anybody know what it is today? It's over 40%, right? Um, in the UK, it was 13%. In Germany, 18%. All of that was greatly increased by the war. But this was only one sort of thing that was taking place. Albert Einstein managed to overthrow things. And in fact, in, well, in physics, um, Paul Johnson refers to this as, in a way, the beginning of the modern world. Einstein's theory replacing even the most basic physical level what people had thought they understood about the world. Einstein won the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics. Time declared him the person of the century. Why? Well, because of the theory of relativity. Paul Johnson wrote that the modern world began on the 29th of May, 1990, when photographs of a solar eclipse taken on the island of Principe off Western Africa and Sobral, Brazil, confirmed the truth of a new theory of the universe, Einstein's theory, which was in some way analogous to the use of perspective in art. And indeed, there is a bit of art without perspective. Here is art with perspective, a sense of depth, a sense of an additional dimension being present. 
and Einstein's theory seem to give people that sense of a three-dimensional world suddenly replaced by a four-dimensional world, an understanding in which things were just given an absolute with a world in which things were relative. So it was a second scientific revolution, as sweeping, in a way, in its intellectual consequences as the first. Now, what was this thing that Dirac referred to as the probably the greatest scientific discovery ever made? Einstein described it in very simple ways, and since time is short, I'm going to skip his um, description, which I think is a little more complicated, and just do something very simple. Suppose I throw a baseball, but I'm throwing it on a moving train. Now, on the train, it looks as if I'm stationary. The catcher is stationary, and let's say I throw a ball at 60 miles an hour. Then it looks as if the ball is traveling at 60 miles an hour, right? Um, that seems unproblematic. But now imagine that the train is traveling at 60 miles an hour, and so the speed of the baseball and the speed of the train are exactly the same. If we're going in the same direction, then it will look to you, let's say, standing outside the train, as if the ball is moving at 120 miles an hour. If the train is moving at 60 in the other direction, and I'm throwing a ball like this, it will actually look to you as if the ball was stationary, and somehow the catcher just zooms ahead and catches it. Now, is the ball really stationary, or is it really moving? And if it's moving, at what speed? Is it going 60 miles an hour? That's the way it looks on the train. Is it going 120 or zero, the way it looks to somebody outside the train? Well, there's no absolute truth about this. Velocity is something that is given relative to some inertial frame in this system. And the same thing is true for a trajectory. Einstein's actual example has to do with something that looks like a straight line from one point of view, if the person's moving, looking like a parabola from the point of view of someone else. So, it looks like velocity, curvature, or you know, the path that someone, something takes, even length, uh, all of this turns out to be relative, according to the theory. But here's what's weird. If I shine a flashlight on the train, that looks like it's the light looks like it's traveling at the same velocity inside the train as it does out. Why? And the theory is introduced to explain. How can light seem to have a constant velocity when everything else has a mirror in front of Somebody had a question? OK, good. <laughs> OK, so this has to do with when things are simultaneous. Something will look simultaneous to an observer on the train that doesn't look simultaneous to someone outside the train. It has to do with velocity, as I mentioned, but also distance, also time. All of these things, which philosophers have thought of as primary qualities in the thing itself, turn out, according to Einstein, to be relative. However, not everything is relative. The laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. So often, people confuse the theory of relativity with relativism. And that appalled Einstein, because he thought the whole point of the theory was to say, yes, things like motion and trajectory and distance, those are relative. But the laws of physics are not relative. The speed of light is absolute. It is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in every inertial frame. And the same thing is true of the other laws of physics. So what is it relative? Well, the speed of light, the laws, they are things that are invariant with respect to transformations. And so here is one way of writing down the laws of relativistic mechanics. Those are familiar laws, well, except for the first one, which distinguishes rest ma mass from inertial mass and says inertial mass depends on the speed of light. It's mass in the ordinary physical sense plus kinetic energy over the speed of light squared. Now, the speed of light's a big number, so that k over c squared is going to be a very small number. This will be detectable only in a very large astronomical context or when things get approaching the speed of light. Anyway, if you love physics and math, these slides are here for you. Pat, you that say, see, this is awesome stuff. If you don't, don't worry. There will be no quiz questions about the relationship okay, between inertial mass and rest math. Okay? This is just something I think is super cool. But it doesn't imply relativism. It contradicts it. Now, this was only one of the theories that started undermining people's traditional faith, that they knew what was going on in the world. Freud introduced his theory, which we'll look at in much more detail later, that really all of our thoughts are covered for underlying subconscious impulses. Just as Einstein saying, in effect, the world is not at all what you thought it is. It's all relative to things that you didn't know it was relative to. Freud says, your intellectual life isn't giving you the real reasons you're doing things. 
They're all fake. They are rationalizations for things your subconscious mind is directing. And so there's something deeper under the surface that is controlling you. All sorts of artistic movements sprang up. All of them before the war, but they became popular and much more influential after the war. So one of them called Fauvism. Fauve is the French word for beast. And so this was a reference to these artists being beasts among the artistic community. Uh, Henri Matisse uh, was one of the key people in this movement. Here is an example, a woman with a hat. Now, notice the flat shapes in that, but also the outrageous colors. Her face was not really green. Well, maybe it was. I mean, maybe this was Halloween or something, but I don't think so. Um, anyway, uh, here's the way one critic described it. A pot of paint has been flung in the face of the public. But and in fact, when this painting was at first displayed, critics hated it. Nobody bought it. But he thought he was going to be in deep trouble. But then Gertrude and Leo Stein, very prominent intellectuals from the United States, bought the painting and helped to make the movement seem legitimate. Futurism was another movement. We'll talk more about it later. Um, here you see the dynamism of a dog on a leash, one of my favorite uh, works from this movement. It stressed speed, movement, technology, and also violence, as we'll see. It suggested getting rid of the past and replacing it with something dramatically new. Futurism, ah, yes, also involved paintings like this, the dynamism of a cyclist. Notice how far removed. If I just said, what's that a painting of? I doubt many of you would have said, oh, someone on a bicycle. But that's what it's meant to represent. It's all about the dynamics of the motion and also some intuition of what it's really like to be a cyclist. There was cubism. Like here, a girl with a mandolin. Multiple perspectives shown all at once. We've got, yeah, <laughs> expressionism, inspired by works like this, which is the screen. Expressing emotion. These are artists who were explicitly influenced by Nietzsche, trying to distort reality to show you the underlying emotion. All of these were ways of trying to get at something deep that was below the level of rationality. And the same thing was true in music, with Stravinsky, The Rites of Spring, oh. which started a riot when it was first heard. Oh, yeah, people, this was first performed, and then a riot, the, the audience got very upset. He did things like all sorts of bizarre rhythms, shifting accents, uh, amazing chord structures like an E flat chord in the low notes, and, uh, sorry, an E chord, an E major in the low notes, and an E flat seven in the higher notes. What? Um, outrageous, but people have never heard things like that yeah, before. Yeah. They were very upset. <laughs> so, that was followed by Schoenberg and Baird and other musical movements that shattered people's ideas of humor. Yeah. Were, 